suspense. Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present Mr. Burt Lancaster in The Long Wait, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. Over the river and through the woods to Grandmother's house we go. The horse knows the way to carry the sleigh. Hey, that's not the way hurrah for Thanksgiving Day goes. What do you mean? Why, I wrote it. No matter. The 1950 version is different. Listen. Over the river and through the woods, the snow is soft and white. Grandpa is happy with his jalopy. His spark plugs are autolite. Over the river and through the woods, blow high, ye winds blow low. The car is as snappy as Grandma and Pappy. Because autolite resistor spark plugs get it going faster in cold temperatures. Give smooth, even spark all along the line of fire. Let your engine idle smoother, run better on leaner gas mixtures. Save gas. Wait a minute. These last lines don't rhyme. Why, sure they do. Your car and Autolite resistor spark plugs are always in rhyme. In fact, you're always right with Autolite. And now, with the long wait and with the performance of Burt Lancaster, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. I stepped off the train at Grand Central. I spotted Len Bush waiting for me. All the heat of my body sucked into my head. I knew that feeling. I felt that way every time I wanted to kill a man. He waved to me. I turned my back and I started up the ramp to the upper level in the street. He caught up to me and he kept pace with his long, shuffling lope. Don't get me wrong, Dan. I don't want to hound you. Now, why begin, Lieutenant? Something you said to the warden before you left. You want to repeat on it? I told him I'd be back for the limit. In this town, we don't even like guys to steal apples off push carts. So when it comes to you murder... You can't touch me. I serve my full time. I'm clean. You just got to sit back and wait for it to happen. Your brother died two years ago. Everybody's cooled off. Why don't you let it lay? I don't cool so easy. If Richie could come back, he'd say, forget it. Don't tell me what my brother would say. All right, all right, I won't. I don't know why I butt into other people's affairs anyway. It's not my job to worry about things before they happen. You'll be the first to know, Lieutenant. You're a jerk if you put your neck in a noose to rub out a dame like Lois Williams. So long, Jack. I waited until he was swallowed in the crowd. Then I went across and down Park until I made the Coronet Hotel on 40th Street. Dan Vettel? Oh, yes. Mr. Thompson reserved a room for you. Yeah. 423. The elevator was an old cage that pulled itself upward, like an old man with asthma climbing stairs. I caught the reflection of my face in the panel mirror of the cage. Three years housekeeping with the state had left a mark. A little paler, maybe. Serene was the word for me. That's the way the reporter put it. The serene countenance of an alabaster saint, showing no trace of the killer rampant under the shell. Only I hadn't killed anyone. Yet. I got out of the elevator and I found 423. Inside, I made for the bathroom. I felt under the washstand. The gun was there. Shorty Thompson had it taped neatly in place, just like he'd promised. I pried it loose. I heard someone at the door. I yanked it open. Lois Williams came in. Not exactly came in. She sort of slithered in along the wall and hung there like a busted balloon. The little rat was as beautiful as ever. The scared look in her eyes made them brighter, greener. She was wearing one of those curved gowns that she used to design for herself and was pointed up neat and tidy. She stared at the gun in my hand in a kind of a, a, kind of a glad, hungry way. Or I'd save you the trouble of coming for me. I'd have found you. But well, thanks anyway. What are you waiting for? I don't know. Go ahead. Kill me. Don't hurry me. Go ahead. You want me dead and I don't want to live. You want to die. That's why you came to me. There's one thing, Dan, about Richie. I didn't think he'd kill himself. You figured he'd enjoy looking at his wife and kids through bars for the next ten years, huh? I've lost every friend I had because of that. Nobody will speak to me, have anything to do with me. I can't get a job either. No club will hire me. They're all afraid of me. What do you expect? They all knew how I felt about my brother. By the way, how is Tim Grady? I'm going to look him up, too. That's a kick. I ratted on Richie to save Tim, and then he shook me loose. He didn't want anything to do with a squealer, he said. And you still love that dirty... It took him to make you miserable enough to want to die, huh? All right, so now you know. No job, no friend, no Tim. I got nothing to live for. My brother had everything to live for, and you. He 
kill himself. Then save the postmortem till after you do the job. This was the dame who caused my brother's death. But she wasn't scared. She was begging for it. Something was wrong. She came closer to me. She looked up at me with that... that haunted thing all over her. Desire for an end of life. I thought of her suddenly dead, still looking at that. I couldn't do it. It wasn't right. I put my gun back in my pocket. She saw me do it. Even when I try to get myself killed, I fumble. I'll take care of it myself. Hey, watch it, you crazy little... Come here. Oh, I you. I'm allergic to people jumping out of windows. Especially out of a room registered as my name. Come here. Why? Why did you stop me? Why? You always were a high-strung game. Now go on, go home. Go home and sleep it off like it was a jag. I don't have a home. You really don't. Huh? I got nothing. I told you, I got nothing. No. No, it's no fun this way. Oh well. Wait a minute. I'll take you to a room in the hotel. Here, here, have a drink. You'll feel better. Thanks. Lois. Lois, I'd like to help you. You help me? Why? tell you the truth, I don't know. But I know what Richie meant to me. I was with him when he died. I, I heard the way he called your name. Oh, Dan, listen to me. Before I... you became a singer, you were, a, you were a dress designer. Oh, what does that prove? Well, it proves your troubles are over if you want them to be. The only way my troubles will be over is for you to use that gun. There's a way that doesn't hurt so much. The nerve doc says there's nothing like starting your own business or cracking a safe to get your mind off troubles. What do you know about psychiatry? Nothing. But I know plenty about cracking safes. And I understand business is almost the same thing. Go into business. I haven't got a dime. I'll supply the coin. We'll be partners. Yeah? And what? The dress business. The dress business. <laughs> the boys would laugh you out of town. Nobody laughs at Dan Verrill. Well, come on, what do you say? Partners? I, I haven't designed a dress for you. Oh, it'll come back to you? Once you're in business, you're sure to make a lot of new friends. Get a new slant on life. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll talk to the old gang into giving you a break again. If things are going smooth, you'll be happy again. You think so? I looked at her a minute. And then I put across the clincher. Lois, I'll bet even Tim Grady comes back. I was always baffled by the effect a guy could have on a dame. I watched Hope push some of the unhappiness off her face. Mention the guy and the dame's heart changes places with her brain. She hesitated a second. I'll give it a try. Good. Now, do you think you can make it past bridges and open manholes, or do you need protection? I'm all right now. After all, we're partners. I raised 20 grand, and Lois went all out spending. She threw herself into the job with all she had, and she had plenty. She was going to open on Madison Avenue. I spent a lot of time with Lois, talking dress shop. She took me to spots to, well, you know, to check styles. The dog show, the art galleries, the opera. She was beginning to show signs of wanting to live again. A month after we became partners, she told me. We can open tomorrow, Dan, except that, well, I... Let's have it, Lois. The money's all run out. And, Dan, we have to advertise and get a sales force. What'll it take? Five thousand. Oh, three thousand. Oh, I'll get it. Oh, Dan. She kissed me. And I fought down the chill that sent along my spine. I said... I want you to be happy, Lois. I went over to the Emerald Club on 60th to raise the money. I stayed away from the old spots till now. Lou Henry, who owned the place, glad handed me when I walked in. Hey, Dan Farrell. Where you been, boy? All around and about. Yeah, you're awful early, Dan. Tables don't open until 10. I need five grand, Lou. Five grand? Without even a hello to soften me up? I need it, Lou. I figured you'd let me have it. For past favors. Oh, sure, Dan. Don't mean no more to me than my right arm. Thanks. Be seeing you. Hey, Dan. What are you? Your brothers is out there at the bar. Shorty Thompson. Oh, thanks again. I'd like to see Shorty. Another one, bartender. Hello, Shorty. Huh? Ah, oh, you, huh? Hey, you're in business, Dan. Something real imaginative, huh? Yeah, legitimate, too. Ladies' gowns. Ain't that a riot? <laughs> Shorty was drunk. I don't like to talk to drunks. I was going to leave when I saw who the guy was on the other side of, the sh of Shorty. 
It was Lieutenant Len Bush. Shorty turned his back on me and spoke to him. This guy is Richie Vowell's brother, as though you didn't know. A few years ago, the joke was on you, Lieutenant. You put Dan away for sticking up a jewelry store. You didn't really believe Dan Verrill had pulled anything as crude as that. It was Richie who'd done it. But Big Brother here took the rap. Shut up, Shorty. Used to be sort of a gag with the boys. If Richie got shot, Danny Boy would do the bleeding for him. <laughs> everybody knew that Richie was one in a million. Everybody knew that Danny Boy would die for the kid. Yeah, I'm going to let you in on the secret, Bush. Danny Boy's partner is the dame who killed Richie Varro. You're drunk, Shorty. Get away from me, you rat. I turned back to the bar and I kept my temper in my pocket. If Shorty kept talking like that, it wouldn't be healthy for him, and I didn't want him to do anything to him. He was Richie's best friend. Two more of Richie's friends walked in while I was downing my drink. Gus Manning and Tommy Algo. I put my glass down and I started to leave. Just a minute, then. What's on your mind? The way I get the news, you and Lois had teamed up. Yeah? That's all I want to know, you think. Hey, hold it, Gus, hold it. Maybe Dan's got it scrambled. Lieutenant, Lois Williams is a dame who pinned the rap on Richie, ain't she? Any newspaper morgue will give you the answer. Look, I know she testified against him. And you know she lied about your brother to save Tim Grady. I know. Well? All right. Lieutenant, the boys and I want to have a little talk. Okay, Dan, it's your funeral. We all watched Len put on his hat and walk out. I put my back up against the bar so none of them could get behind me. Well, what are we waiting for? Right, right. 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 You okay? Yeah. What happened? Boys don't like me just now. They want to keep me from making a girl happy. Yeah, yeah, the girl responsible for your brother's death. Yeah, that's right. is bringing you Mr. Burt Lancaster in The Long Wait, tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. And now it's time for my Thanksgiving fairy tale. Last night, my car called me out to the garage. Harlow, I don't feel good. I think you ought to do something about it. Well, open your hood and say ah. Ah. Ooh, your spark plugs need replacing. I'll buy you a new set of Autolite resistor spark plugs with the exclusive Autolite 10,000 ohm built-in resistor. Gosh, Harlow, would you? That's better than turkey on Thanksgiving. Just think how I'll run. Yes, you'll start faster in cold temperatures with Autolite resistor spark plugs. Give smoother idling and better performance on leaner gas mixtures, which means you'll even save me gas. And the neighbors will be thankful because they know Autolite resistor spark plugs reduce spark plug interference with radio and television reception. I know all that, so why wait? Well, I hustled up a set of Autolite resistor spark plugs, and those eyes, I mean those Autolite bullseye headlights, lit up with joy. You're a good boss, Harlow. Now, the moral is, if you want your car to thank you for helping it run better, see your Autolite spark plug dealer and have him replace old, worn-out, narrow-gap spark plugs with a set of the sensational new wide-gap Autolite resistor spark plugs. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage our star Burt Lancaster with Betty Lou Gerson in The Long Wait, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I said the five grand to Lois so that she could open the doors while I went after business. And I knew where to get it. Nobody spends dough on a dame like a hood when he's loaded. On Thursday, the Third National Bank was held up. Friday morning, I... I knocked on the door on 8th Avenue. Who is it? Me, Dan Farrell. Uh, busy now, Dan. Some other time? Hello, t- hello, Tony. Oh, hello, Glenda. Hello. What do you want, Dan? You knocked over the Third National. What is this, a hijack? No. Your dame looks like she needs a lot of clothes. After last night, I figure on getting plenty of touch. What are you two talking about? I'm in the dress business, Tony. Tell the other boys, too. I want all the dames buying their clothes from... Lois Williams. <laughs> sure. What do I care where they buy them? The next day I ran into Numbers Johnson. He ran the policy racket on the east side. I don't have a dame, Dan. 
You know that. Yeah, I know. It's about time you gave your wife a break. Yeah, if I buy her clothes now, she'll expect me to every time I hit. And that's the idea. Do you see it my way, or do no, I... I don't figure it. You, in the dress business. Well, if I keep happy in the dress business, I'll stay out of the numbers business. Which way do you want to play? Uh, the doll will get some new duds. Once the ball started rolling, it became a mountain. Lois knew all the angles on female frills. Her clientele was strictly 10th Avenue, but she turned them out on a Long Island, and they loved it. One dame tells another, and in no time at all, the shop is jammed with customers. It was a crime in the way the dame spent the dough the hoods go to to make so much trouble to collect. Lois glowed like a firefly. She was a complete businesswoman. She loved being surrounded with dolls who bounced in and out with business of the shop. Business that must have Madame's attention. I asked her during a lull. You happy, Lois? Yes, Dad. Almost completely. I do miss the old gang, though. Oh, come in. Pardon me, Miss Williams. There's a Mrs. Verrill outside. She, she wants to see Mr. Verrill. Mrs. Ver... Oh. Richie's wife, June. She was supposed to be in the mountains with the kid. That's why I sent her money. I didn't want her to know about this. She was waiting for me on the street. She had a roll of bills in her hand, and she threw it at my feet. The roll bounced against the storefront. I saw the rubber band snap off it and the bills unwrap like a, like a sigh of relief. You think I'd take your money now? Now? Well, what do you mean? You and Lois. Okay, so it's tainted money, but you got a kid, you need it. You thought a lot of Richie, didn't you? As much as you did. Oh, no, much more. When Richie had pneumonia, I remember how hard you took it. During the crisis, you wouldn't eat or drink or talk. I remember thinking if Richie dies, Dan will die, too. Take the money for the kid. You loved Richie. And now you're sponsoring that woman with his blood. Uh, uh, June, wait. I'll kill you both. Nobody was going to keep me from doing what I wanted. Not Lynn Bush following me around, or Shorty Thompson hating my guts, or Richie's wife itching to kill me. I'd given Lois back an urge to live. I swore I was going to make her happy, and I was on first base. She had a going business. <laughs> Lois's old gang hung out in the village, the bolo room. Richie, Lois, and Tim Grady used to pal around with the musicians who played the spot. They used to wait until closing time, and then huddle with the jive artists until morning. When Lois and Tim double-crossed Richie, the, the other kids cut Lois out of their hair, and Tim Grady left town. That night, I went down to the bolo room to get Lois's friends back for her. I walked in just as the last paying customers left. The kids were getting set for a jam session when they spotted me place became full of hush. They glared at me, hating me, but not daring to open their mouths. I picked a menu up off a table and I laid it on the bar. I pulled a pencil out of my pocket. I said, I'm giving a party for Lois Williams. You're all invited. Saturday night, gold room, Carnet Hotel. Whitey Jones? Yeah? I'm putting you down, plus your dame and three guests. Suppose I can't make it. <laughs> and throw away your piano. You'll never play it with broken hands. Phil Bless? You, your dame, and three friends, and your horn. Well? Okay, yeah, sure, Danny, sure. Jerry Barton, Mel Foley, what? Joe Ward, Les Seltzer. Your dames and three friends. Okay. okay. Right. And make sure that Lois knows that you're all tickled to death to see her. I'll be checking you off as you come in. I'll be seeing you at 7 Friday, the day before the party. Hello? Hello, Dan. Yeah? This is Lou Henry, down at the Emerald Club. Yeah. Look, I don't want you to think I'm butting into your affairs, Dan, but well, knowing how you feel about Lois. Yeah? Well, June, your brother's wife's been down here talking to Shorty Thompson. So what? She talked Shorty into rubbing out Lois. What? He's on his way now. Remember who told you, Dan? I dialed my buddy caught on fire. If Shorty touched Lois now, being a buddy of Richie's wouldn't help him. The same went for June. Give me Miss Williams. I'll connect you with her office. Come on, snap it up, snap it up. I'm ringing, sir. Come on, Lois, answer, come on. Miss Williams' office? Put Lois on. Well, she's not in. Who's calling me? It's me, Dan Varrow. Where'd she go? Mr. Varrow? You just called, Mr. Varrow. What do you mean, I just called? Well, someone called, said it was you, and spoke to Miss Williams. I wonder why they do that. Well, never mind that. What did, she, what did he say? Miss Williams always goes to the Museum of Art at this time of day to copy designs. She made an appointment to meet you. I, I mean, the man who called at the museum. She just left. 
I didn't wait for the elevator. I took the stairs three at a time going down. I came out on the street. A cab was idling on the other side of the avenue. I cut through the traffic to get to it. I hopped into the cab and for five bucks the hacky crashed lights all the way. I was at the museum and nothing flat. When I entered the building, it was quiet as a mall. I cursed myself for not asking what room Lois would be in. Here, here, you can't run here. Uh, uh, did you see a girl with, a, with drawing papers and crayons, tall, beautiful, well-stacked? I see hundreds of them. Well, where would she go to, to draw designs? Well, the armor room, maybe, the Egyptian room, or the famous paintings. Second floor. I had visions of a dead in some corner. I thought of her all twisted in the heat. I hit the Egyptian room on a run, and I stopped short. Lois was standing at the other end. She was behind a mummy case. And on the other side of it was Shorty. He had a knife in his hand. They didn't see me. I sneaked up on them, and I watched Lois fighting Lois, to move her lips. Please. Lois, run, run to me! Dad! Dad! Here it is! I hate to do this, Shorty! Oh, oh, good Dad! Came this way, Lieutenant. Dad, he tried to kill me! He Chop to keep up with you, Dan. Still with me, eh, Lieutenant? I always keep an eye on my friends. Who's this laying here? Oh, Shorty oh, Thompson. Dad. You better take him in. He tried to kill Miss Williams. Yeah, I guess it better. Come on, Lois. By the way, Bush. Huh? You better pick up June Barrel, too. She was in on it. In case you don't know who she is... She's my sister-in-law. With June and Shorty out of the way for a while, nothing was going to upset things now. The party Saturday night in the gold room was a big success. Every time somebody tried to make a break for home, I, I beat them to the exit and insisted they stay. The place was full of smiles and how to do. And only Lois didn't know they were phony. She was a dream in a green, backless evening gown, held up by a deep breath and an anxious look. She bubbled around, greeting people. Hey, thank you. I enjoyed it. Lois. Dan, where have you been hiding? No place. Tell me, Lois. You happy? Dan. Just be happy. That's all I ask. Just be happy. I'm doing my best, Dan. Is there any guy here you like? Anybody? Uh, There's just one guy for me, Dan. He's not here. But he is. He's back in town. He's at the Sphinx Hotel. Tim. Yeah. Lois, I think I'll drop over and see him now. Dan, you're not going to do anything? Don't worry, Lois. I'm going to fix everything. She had her job, her friends. Just one thing more. Just Tim Grady to make the picture complete. The Sphinx Hotel was over in 6th Avenue. I walked. I wanted time to cool off. I wanted to do things right. Yes? Mr. Grady's room? One moment, This is Dan Barrow. Dan? Yeah, remember? It's 3 a.m., Dan. I won't take much of your time. Won't tomorrow do? I'm coming up now. Come in. Pushed open the door and I went in. I was standing by the bed. He was wearing a monogram black robe over some flashy yellow pajamas. He glad handed me. Come in, Dan. Come on in. Have a cigarette? Watched him going through hard times trying to light it for me. I let him sweat for a while, then pulled out my lighter, lit my cigarette, and shoved the lighter under his face so I could light his. I couldn't stand still. He moved around the room like a like a cat on hot coals. He was a big, good-looking chick, broad shoulders with all the trimmings, curly hair, dimple on his chin. I just got back, out on the coast. That's the place to be, Dad. You never saw anything like it. Boy, the things that go on in L.A. <laughs> Someday... Light someplace. And you say, Dan... Lois is a great dame. She sure is, Dan. She sure is. Anybody said it different should get slugged. Yeah. Listen, Dan, there never was anything between me and Lois. Anybody says different's a no good liar. We were just good friends. We hardly ever even went Relax. Else. Here, you and Lois are partners. Yeah. She must be pretty near the happiest girl in town. Pretty near. Huh? You know, when I first saw Lois a few months ago, she was all set to kill us. Oh, wait a minute, Dan. I tell you, I... Sit down, Tim. You make me nervous. Nobody's blaming you for the way she felt. Now, tomorrow, tomorrow I pull out of the partnership, and Lois will be alone again. I don't want her to be alone. It's not good for her. Anything I can do, you know. She's in love with you. I'd like to see her get married. A woman with... with $75,000 business, well, she needs someone to look after her interests. The mention of the 75 grand, his eyes lit up like Broadway after dark. Reading his mind was like looking through a dirty window into a filthy room. 
It hurt to think a foul ball like Tim Grady could make a girl do anything for him. Well, Dan... It's about time she got a proposal for marriage. Yeah. Why don't you call her up, Tim? Yeah. A good idea, Dan. I mean, right now. Stuyvesant, 1541. Now? Well, sure, sure, if you think... (laughs) I won't know what to say. It's been so long. Say you want to marry her. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Lois? Hello, baby. Well, I'll see you knew the old voice. I closed the door. I didn't know if I'd be able to control myself if I'd listen to any more. I got to the dress shop at 10 o'clock the next morning. Lois was floating around like a... like a waft of loveliness. She touched the inkstand on her desk, moved a chair, straightened a picture. Wasn't conscious of what she was doing. She talked fast and happy about things that didn't mean a thing. She flung open a window and hugged the inrush of air. She spoke with her back to me. Oh, Dan, it's wonderful. It's wonderful, isn't life, you? You're happy, huh, Lois? Tim was waiting when I got here this morning. He proposed. He said you wanted it that way, too. I guess I'm the happiest woman in the world. <laughs> Can I use your phone? Sure. Sure. Call Paris, Bombay, Shanghai. <laughs> Imagine it. Tim. I'm assigned, Lieutenant Bush. Dan Verrill talking. I'm at Lois' shop. If you get here in five minutes, it'll be about right. Yes, Dan, I'm the happiest woman in the world, and I owe it all to you. She turned from the window and saw the gun in my hand. (gasps) Now you're worth killing. Suspense, presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Burt Lancaster, with Betty Lou Gerson. Oh, boy, am I happy. Thanks again, Harlow. That's my car talking, folks. I ran great today, didn't I? With those new Autolite resistor spark plugs. Like a charm. Friends, if you want your car to run better, switch to White Gap Autolite resistor spark plugs. The spark plugs that get you off to fast starts in cold temperatures. Made by Autolite, they're one of more than 400 products for cars, trucks, planes, and boats produced in 28 Autolite plants coast to coast. These include complete electrical systems used as original equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. Spark plugs, batteries, generators, coils, distributors, starting motors, bullseye sealed beam headlight units. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. Don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and get Autolite, original factory parts, at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next Thursday for Suspense, James Stewart will be our star. The play is called Mission Completed. And it is, as we say, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Tonight's suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The Long Wait is an original play by Fred Freeberger. Bert Lancaster is the star of The Hawk and the Arrow a Norma F.R. production, soon to be released by Warner Brothers. In the coming weeks, you will hear such stars as Mickey Rooney, Lana Turner, and Eddie Cantor. Don't forget, next Thursday, same time, Autolite will present Suspense, starring James Stewart. Meanwhile, see the very informative story about Suspense in the current issue of Quick Magazine. Freedom is everybody's job. Take an active part in national, state, and community affairs to protect your liberties. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.